exciting. This never normally happens. It might shock you to learn that Antarctica actually melts quite a lot. The very first Antarctic explorers in the early 1900s noted large areas of melt ponds over the floating ice shelves around the continent. But as the climate heats up, it stands to reason that melting at the surface of the ice should be increasing. The thing is, it's actually quite hard to measure melt, and we don't have any long-term data records that allow us to track the amount of melt over time across the entirety of the Antarctic continent. Nor do we have a good handle on which locations regularly experience melt. Or at least we didn't until now. My colleague Dr. Pete Tuckett, who we'll meet in just a second, has just published a piece of work several years in the making that uses some clever techniques to monitor where and when surface melt is strong enough to form ponds and lakes on the surface of the ice. He harnessed the power of cloud computing to process thousands of satellite images from Antarctica and detect the presence of meltwater ponds and lakes on the ice surface. So this data set's new um, because We've conducted the first continent-wide long-term assessment of surface meltwater area. This data set's really enabled us to dive down into some of the, the longer-term trends in terms of uh, what we've observed over the last 15 years, but also um, to identify some spatial variability and how different patterns are occurring in different areas of Antarctica. Meltwater can only collect at the surface under certain conditions in Antarctica. And to understand those conditions, we need to know a little bit about ice sheet mass balance. You can think about the amount of ice in the Antarctic ice sheet like a bank balance. When you get paid, your balance goes up. And when you spend money on frivolous expenses like water, electricity, heating or avocado on toast, your balance goes down. There's only one way that ice sheets get paid. I mean, gain ice. And that is via precipitation, something I actually covered in this video up here. So the ice mass balance goes up when it snows. I'll make it rain, I'll make it rain, I'll make it rain when it snows. But there are several different drains on the ice sheet mass balance. In this economy, hard relate. One way ice sheets lose ice is chunks of ice breaking away at the edges, forming icebergs. How fast the ice flows can affect how much breaks off. and I to remember that fact. In really windy locations, ice loss can also happen via sublimation, which is where ice changes directly into water vapour in the atmosphere. Or if there's liquid water at the surface, then it can evaporate, although that one is pretty uncommon. Then we have melting from below, driven by the intense pressure and friction under the ice, or in the case of floating ice, controlled by the temperature of the ocean, which is the main cause of ice loss in West Antarctica. Or finally, we can get melting at the surface, driven by atmospheric factors. If you get enough of it, rivers and streams form that flow straight into the ocean, something that we see quite a lot of in Greenland. It doesn't happen very much in Antarctica, but it's still important. Surface meltwater is important for two main reasons. Firstly, where we get water on the surface of the ice sheet, that has a darkening effect that can help promote further melting. And the second main reason is that wherever we get surface water, that has the potential to influence ice flow and potentially rates of mass loss from the ice sheet. We get surface meltwater ponding uh, around large parts of the Antarctic margin. And it's most concentrated at the more northerly latitudes. Most of the melting happens around the edges, particularly over floating ice shelves and the Antarctic Peninsula, because it's much warmer there. And so on average, each year, our data shows that we get just over 3,700 kilometres squared of surface meltwater across the entire ice sheet. But occasionally it can be double that. And that equates to roughly two times the size of Greater London in terms of area. We're talking huge areas covered with melt lakes here, although in comparison to the size of Antarctica and the amount of surface melting that occurs each year, it's a drop in the ocean. Or should that be a drop on the ice? So we get surface melting around the majority of the margin of Antarctica, um, but a lot of that snow melt is able to trickle down into the snowpack and often refreeze. But what we're really interested in with this work is how much of that water stays at the surface, isn't able to trickle down into the snow. Meltwater can only form lakes and ponds if the surface is saturated with water. 
Usually melt refreezes in the layers of snow below the surface, but if that snowpack is already full of meltwater, then it has nowhere else to go. No room at the inn. Where the melt ponding happens is also important. For instance, if meltwater collects on the surface of a floating ice shelf, it has a different effect compared to if it ponds on ice that sits on top of rock, so-called grounded ice. So where we get surface meltwater on ice shelves, um, that water has the potential to exploit weaknesses, so cracks and fractures in the ice. And then that water is actually able to potentially penetrate the full, the full depth of the ice shelf um, to the ocean below. And that can have the effect of weakening and destabilizing the ice shelf and potentially leading to a sudden collapse event. The process that Beat described there is exactly what happened to the Larsen A, Larsen B and Wilkins ice shelves in the late 90s and early noughties, and is a process that's especially common on the Antarctic Peninsula. On grounded ice, where water is able to penetrate down and get to the bed of the ice sheet, that can have potential implications for ice dynamics. Water at the beds can help to lubricate the bed, and that can cause variations in ice speed. Remember how I said the speed of ice flow can influence how much ice ultimately gets spat out into the ocean? Well, this is where meltwater impacts that process. If it reaches the rock underneath the ice, then it turns the whole thing into a big icy slip and slide, helping the ice flow more quickly towards the sea. If it's not being topped up by more snowfall, then that leads to greater ice loss. More broadly, we expect surface meltwater ponding on the Antarctic Peninsula. In fact, I've even published quite a few papers about the causes of melt there. But Pete's work has shown that some surprising regions are becoming more prone to meltwater ponding. Our data set suggests that in East Antarctica in particular, the ice sheet's becoming more prone to, to meltwater ponding. East Antarctica has always been thought of as a sleeping giant of sea level rise. Whereas the rapidly warming West Antarctic contains five or so metres of potential sea level increase, the far bigger Eastern ice sheet contains 52 metres worth. Scientists haven't paid it so much attention because it's been stable for so long. But the worry is the giant might be starting to rouse from its slumber. Pete's work highlighted several East Antarctic ice shelves on which especially large meltwater lakes formed, including the Amory, Roi Baudouin, and Shackleton ice shelves. Interestingly, also all ice shelves that we identified as susceptible to melting in this 2021 paper I wrote. But what's causing this increase in melt ponding in East Antarctica? In 2022, amidst a record-breaking heat wave, the Conga ice shelf in the East Antarctic collapsed following an atmospheric river event. That was an example of how an extreme weather event can be the final straw in a series that triggers the collapse of an ice shelf. In Conga's case, several decades of weakening preceded the collapse, driven not by surface melting, but by other factors controlling the flow of ice. But it turns out that across the continent, the biggest melting events with the greatest melt ponds are almost exclusively associated with specific localised weather features, including several that I've covered on this channel, like fern winds, clouds and atmospheric rivers. The most extreme melt events are likely influenced by local, local weather phenomena. Particularly high temperatures, particularly high um, wind events, can all help to drive surface melting, which can cause these most extreme events. Climate change is making extreme events more extreme, and also creating the conditions for them to occur more often. This probably means that we'll see more melting in future, but whether that will mean more melt ponds isn't so clear. So we know that the Antarctic ice sheet is going to experience more surface melting in coming decades, in line with global climate warming. And a really key question is how much of that extra surface melting is going to translate to ponded water and what that will mean for the future. We now really need to use this data set in combination with remote sensing studies, but also model data sets um, to really try and understand which regions are most likely to be vulnerable to the surface water um, and what that may mean in terms of future mass loss. Currently, the area of Antarctica covered by melt ponds is pretty small, and it's important to say that East Antarctica is much less vulnerable than West Antarctica. But studies have shown signs of ocean warming undercutting important ice shelves and glaciers in East Antarctica too. So 
Is the sleeping giant waking up? We've observed this overall increase in surface meltwater in East Antarctica, and we have indications that the ice sheet surface is becoming more prone to meltwater ponding. What that will mean for future stability um, is really too early to say, unfortunately. For now, it's not clear from the data whether East Antarctica is becoming less stable, but it's clearly a region to keep an eye on, because this is a sleeping giant that we definitely want to tiptoe around. Thanks to Pete for explaining this exciting new piece of work, and to you for watching all the way to the end. If you like the videos I make, then please do give them a thumbs up and a share, and if you want to support the channel even further, then please do consider becoming a supporter over on Patreon. My fantastic patrons help me to make these videos better, and they also get exclusive early access to content. They help shape the content itself, as well as getting the occasional bloopers reel. Now watch this one next to learn more about snow and rain in Antarctica, and until next time.